kind of started off at, at Singularity University in 2010. And so I'm almost at the 10 year point, which just boggles my mind in a way, because I feel like I've been here for about three years. But I don't feel that way when I come in, because I, I just know so many of you from different places over the last 10 years, and this is the one time in the year where I get to sort of see you all. So thank you for being a part of this journey. It's, um, it's a wonderful life to be able to go through it with, with people like you. So I thought I'd talk about three things today. Um, one is a little bit about inspirational goals, and, and you'll understand in the talk what that means. And then just a little bit about leadership and a little bit about impact. And then we get to enjoy the evening together, which is what I'm looking forward to. Um, my grandmother was born in Hollyhead, Wales, and my father was born there too. And she was born in 1903. And in 1903, the entire world believed that controlled, sort of heavier than air flight was not possible. I mean, they believed that. It wasn't that they were expecting it and that it would happen any day. They believed that in the way that most of the world thinks we can't live forever. And maybe that's true, and maybe that's not true, but it's, it's that kind of a certainty in the belief. And I want you to think about what happened in her lifetime, going from a world that was certain that it wasn't possible to the world that we have today, where 747s take off every day and not only do we not think anything of it, but there's no one there to even watch it. My father was uh, also born in Wales. And, you know, he had a fascination as I was growing up with flight. And, and I didn't understand it, but uh, when I got to about 12, he had told me a story and it helped me to understand it. But I was really into these, these Wright brothers for a while. This is a photo of their, you know, their first powered, controlled, sustained airplane. I mean, people had, had had something fly for a little bit. They were hot air balloons, but the idea of powered flight was an idea that didn't seem possible to the world. I, uh, I went to high school in Dayton, Ohio, which is where they were from and where their bicycle company was. That's Orville sitting in the plane. Wilbur's running next to him because they didn't think it would do it in a controlled way and he was there to prevent his brother from dying. Um, actually, Orville had set up the camera hoping that this might work, which he had done many, many times before and there was a small sort of balloon that he had somebody else hold to press to take a photo if it actually worked. And sure enough, it, it did work that day. This is a, a real photo, it's, uh, it's enhanced, the details of it. But it's a stunning photo. And I'm so pleased that they took a photo of that moment. Most of the great things we have in the world, there's no photo for that moment. And the moment is important, and I'll come towards the end of the talk as to why those moments are important and the record that they show about what's possible by ordinary people. This is a photo taken around the 1940s of an airplane. My father was in school in the United Kingdom. They were at war. And he would tell me stories about the bombings and how they would have to hide. And you could actually go to jail for a very long time if you turned on a light. Because they would turn all the lights off to hide from Nazi bombers 
which is how they navigated at that time. And it's a fascinating thing because in his high school, if an airplane flew over, the entire school was allowed out to see it. That's how rare and stunning it was. And I remember him telling me that story. And so I had a bit of this strange experience uh, because I see Nick in the audience too. And so some of us used to run the graduate studies program of Singularity University. It's our largest program. It's about 10 weeks long. And one of the moments that we had the first time that I'd been involved in that in 2011 was Brad Templeton had come and he was very involved in the early thinking around the autonomous car. And he announced to the class that he had actually brought an autonomous car and it was sitting outside in the back. And before he got to the end of the sentence, the whole class just stood up and ran outside in the back to see it. And I had that moment that probably my father had when an airplane flew over the moment of something memorable and significant happening to the human species. This was the ideas that they had of how we might fly. There was a dream that we might fly like that, Superman. And, you know, I was thinking it was a good thing it didn't work out that way. Because I know many of you flew from very far distances and I'm going to guess that it wouldn't have been so enjoyable to fly that way from Europe or India or Southeast Asia. I mean, not just the stuff getting in your eyes, but I mean, it's just, it's just, you'd have to pay attention the whole time. And I mean, it would have been crazy. And so even our best dream of it wasn't as good as what happened. (laughs) Our best dream of it wasn't as good as what we got. The discovery of flight was not so much a discovery, it, it was an invention of flight. And it, for the Wright brothers, it wasn't just about accidentally getting it right. They got into the math. They got into the science of it. They got into... Bernoulli's law, which which describes this bizarre phenomena that air molecules, when they're moving, have a lower pressure than air molecules that are not moving, which to this day, we do not understand why. Because we don't understand the quantum mechanics enough to understand why that's true. We have fantastic equations around Bernoulli's law about what happens and how you measure it, and how much that happens, but we don't even still understand the physics of it. And that same physics, if you're curious, is the reason that the shower curtain pulls into you when you're in the shower, and you keep having to kick it away. Because as the water molecules go flying by, they move the air, and moving air has lower pressure than non-moving air, and that's why the shower curtain keeps pulling in. but we still don't have a grasp of how and why, because it was a complex thing. And Orville and Wilbur tried to understand that. They, of course, never did, but they at least understood the physics of it, which allowed them to come up with a wing that would support the first controlled flight. This is a quote from Jack Handy. He's the comedian on Saturday Night Live that has the quotes that come up sometimes at the end of the stage. We like to praise birds for flying, but how much of it is actually flying? And how much of it is just sort of coasting from the previous flap? We don't give enough credit to inventors because they... They change the world. And we rarely know how, and we rarely know why. And going to the moon is almost no different. I vividly remember it. I was sitting on my dad's lap with my two sisters next to me, July 20th, 
1969, about 50 years ago. We just did a celebration at the United Nations around that, thanks to Kunal Sood, who I think is in the audience today. The 50th anniversary of it. It was a stunning thing, even for me as a little kid. And the science behind it was complex and difficult. In fact, so difficult that there's really been only a nation in the world that's still only done it. In fact, we don't even go out and do it anymore because we're not even sure that we can do it really well and that we can pull it off again. But it was a difficult thing. And the number of inventions that had to happen and the number of people that had to pull it off and come together and cooperate and be optimistic at a time where optimism would have been difficult, if not almost impossible. Because we started to do this at a time where people didn't even think it was possible to go to the moon. And it's been long enough now that we don't necessarily vividly remember it. But I remember that face. And there are still people today that believe and are certain that we did not go to the moon. <laughs> I mean, these, they really believe that. And there's a lot of science around how and why they believe it wasn't possible to do that. Disruption isn't hard because of the technology. Disruption is hard because of people. And because of the way people work inside of organizations. But most importantly, because of the beliefs that people hold. And the beliefs that people hold may be different than truth or reality. But human beings, we operate on beliefs. And so optimism and pessimism matter. And they matter because pessimism can actually stop something from working. And optimism can make something that we're certain couldn't work actually still work. I'll give you an example of it. In 1949, the United Nations was created after that world war. It was a horrific war. And it was the second time that we'd gotten into a world war. In under two decades, the second time. And so they created the United Nations very specifically with just one mission, which was to stop World War III. And we owe them enormous credit because they did that job. And for almost any of the political analysts in the world, we must credit them for that. Because there were a lot of times, even in many of the lives of people in this room, where there were moments where that almost happened again. And those moments go by very briefly and sometimes very secretly. But it almost happened again and they were successful at it. And this is the stunning thing to me. The stunning thing to me is not that I couldn't believe that they stopped World War III. The stunning thing to me was that they disrupted themselves. That several years ago they realized that the biggest problem in the world wasn't stopping World War III. And they got enough people together, a few people who weren't even at the UN, a few people that weren't even responsible for trying to change the UN, stood up and started to talk to people at the UN to get enough people at the UN to realize that that wasn't the biggest problem. And within four years of that starting, the UN disrupted itself and became 
all about the 17 sustainable development goals. Now, the UN, as proud as I am of their achievements, is one of the most political and bureaucratic organizations in the world. There's no one I know that doesn't doubt that. It's not a criticism. If the UN can disrupt themselves, no one else has an excuse. <laughs> now here's what's interesting. What's different about us going to the moon than what these 17 problems were? Because there's something distinctly different about what happened here. Because we actually now have a collective agreement around the world that these are at least 17 of the top 20 problems of the world. There might be some debate. In fact, I've always thought that they left off the 18th one, which was around governance and changing governance, because maybe they didn't want that on there. But we can at least agree that these are the biggest problems in the world. And now the world is focused on solving these problems. And some of these problems are so severe that if we don't solve them, we could actually be heading to a mass eventual extinction event. Top scientists believe that. It's not rhetoric. They believe that. But what's different about what the moon? What's different is that when we went to the moon, we weren't trying to solve a problem. I mean, I, I'm so excited that we are finally get, have a consensus to solve the world's biggest problems. But life can't just be about solving problems. I am excited, I'm pleased, I'm happy that we have finally figured out the 17 most important problems in the world and that we are now focused on that. But there's more to life than just solving problems. Because what are we solving them for? So I started doing some thinking. And my thinking was around, well, what would we do if we wanted to do something that wasn't about solving a problem? And maybe we should have a set of goals around the world that are like the sustainable development goals, which address a problem, but these weren't like that. They would just be things that were inspirational or things that most people collectively don't think is a problem or don't believe is a problem. So I'll walk you through a few. Because I was thinking, well, what would my wish list be if I had a wish, if I had a wish of 17 things? And I was thinking to myself, well, Whenever you're given wishes, if someone says you have three wishes, what should your first wish be? More wishes. More wishes to humanity translates to solving aging. And most physicians that I speak to in the world don't believe that aging is even a disease. They think aging is just a natural part of being human, and maybe that's true. But in the last 20 years, we have enough scientists now in the world that believe that aging may actually be a disease, that it's a solvable thing. And I'm not saying it's an easy thing. It's a hard thing. But there really are very good theories. In fact, the SENS organization, I think, has one of the best set of theories around the seven things that really contribute to it, and they believe it's solvable, as I do. 
And, and to really get into it, we've got to understand the whys behind it. And there are many whys, and I won't even take the time to get into it. But the biggest why of all is one, that it probably causes the most pain in the world. And two, is we lose our best talent that way. What would it be like if Einstein was still around today? What else might he have done? Or any of the great leaders in the world? What else might they have done? So I do think the problem is hard. And so the next thing I thought was that it's actually too hard for us. It's too hard for us to do in the amount of time that we have left. If we keep normal age dying around, then even the best person in this room won't make it another 80 or 90 years. And so I thought another one was, well, we should start coming up with really good AI. Not AI that looks at data, artificial general intelligence. We should start working on that because we got problems that we're unable to solve. And aging's not even the important one because aging, most people agree, isn't a problem. Some people think if we stopped it, we'd actually have more, which is true. But I think we'd also be able to solve those. And the number of people that work on artificial and general intelligence in the world is unbelievably small. I'm not even sure what it is because it's literally just that small. Now here's the danger. What if the AI starts getting too smart? And that's what everyone is starting to be afraid of. And so to solve that problem, you have to solve this one too, which is a brain interface. And I know it sounds weird. But we have tons of brain interfaces. Over a quarter million people in the world walk around with a cochlear implant. It's actually a device that listens to sound and converts it into electrical signal and then converts it directly into the nerves that go directly to their brain so that they can hear. They, we communicate directly to the brain and they hear that. And so we have devices and now there's some retinas already on the back of the eye that people are using that allows them to see because we communicate directly to the brain. And Elon Musk and Facebook, I mean there's, there's a lot of people now working on it and it's starting to be within our grasp. And the reason it ends up being so important is if we don't do this, we're just going to end up with smart computers that are smart and it's not us which doesn't make for a very good future for us. So we got to do both. And we got to have an interface so that the really smart computers in the future are us. Here's another one. Portable fusion. We tried fusion for a long time. We were really excited about it. And then someone decided that it was just too hard. And pretty much the entire world gave up on it. Now, solar is exciting, and solar is going to be the new energy, and the cost of solar is going to keep going down. But if you do the math on solar, and our energy requirements keep going up, solar is going to take up a lot of land. And it's going to be a really weird world. And guess what? Solar is not really portable. We're not going to be solar powering our jetliners anytime soon nor are we going to be solar powering our rockets or anything else. And so fusion is a fantastically powerful, portable source of energy. And believe it or not, there are some places now where they believe they're getting quite close. Real scientists and engineers with a completely different idea and view. General Fusion, I think, probably being the best one, a, a company in Vancouver, Canada, that's actually getting, they believe, quite close to making this work. We don't need it. It doesn't really solve a particular problem, but we should do it because we can. And when we do it, we will create tons of things that are portable that use it. When we created flying, we weren't thinking about solving a problem. 
When we created the internet, besides the ARPANET that was before, we weren't thinking about solving a problem. But when we created it, the potential of it changed everything. Here's another one. Mars Colony, we all know about this. Elon plans on putting a million people on Mars. And what I'm fascinated by is that he actually came up with a problem as to why. And we could back up Earth, and that was the problem. And I, I, I'm kind of still convinced that maybe Earth needs backing up, but the best place on Mars is still way worse than the worst place on Earth. And so I'm not sure that I, I'm as excited about it as I'd like to be, but I love the idea. And whether or not it solves a problem, we should do it because it excites us. Finding the United States of America didn't solve a problem. It helped some people maybe escape, but countries weren't thinking, gosh, we've got to discover the United States. Here's another. Global ocean on Saturn's moons, Enceladus, pretty interesting place. So a lot of thermal activity underground filled with a gigantic ocean, far more water even than Earth has. And guess what? Life on Earth didn't start on land. In fact, it took like hundreds of millions of years for it ever made it to land. It started in the ocean. So how can we keep looking for life on land on other planets? I think it's actually very exciting and a very real potential that the oceans of Enceladus, if there is life elsewhere on planets, that it would be very likely that it might be there. The thermal currents, we scientists today are very confident that life on Earth started in our oceans and started not even from thermal sun energy, but from the thermal energy of crust underneath. And so we should just check it out, because we can. It's not going to solve a problem for us but it'll change our mindset if we discover that there's life everywhere in the solar system or, or the solar systems around the planet. Here's another one. Alpha Centauri, Proxima Centauri is inside of Alpha Centauri. And we've done some looking lately and it's a pretty interesting place. You can look up in the sky, you can see Alpha Centauri. You can't actually see Proxima because the sun is a little too low discovered in 1915, it's a red dwarf star, it's invisible, but we are certain now that there's an Earth-sized planet around our closest star in the habitable zone. And we believe that it's right in the habitable zone where water is gonna be very likely impossible. And it's a pretty interesting thing, because you look at this Proxima b, it's called, and it actually ends up being almost exactly the same size as Earth. And so it could be pretty interesting to see what's there. And we have the technology now to send a very small device that could take a photo and that we could actually get that information back to kind of find out. And here's why it's interesting. It's interesting because these things are all over the place. I mean, we're, we're aware of thousands now, thousands, that we've actually done the data on and seen of Earth-sized planets in the habitable zone. In fact, the real data is even more exciting. November 4th, 2013, six years ago, based on Kepler's space mission, that there could be as many as 40 billion Earth-sized planets orbiting the habitable zone of sun-like and dwarf red dwarf stars. 40 billion just in our galaxy. And we have a possibility of one very, very close to us, and so we should just take a look. Because who knows what we might find. So I came up with 17 global inspirational goals. And I, they may not be the right ones, but I, let's open the debate about it. And so I'll, I'll post this up, and I got the website, but I couldn't figure out how to post it last night. But the global inspirational goals, let's, let's start to talk. 
about what things we can do that don't solve problems, but they inspire us so that the problems are worth solving in the first place. And clearly, global internet should be one of them. And global currency should be another. And universal citizenship, you know, we have the same governance for hundreds of years when the internet didn't even exist. And so now there's a whole new way to do things. And now we realize that animals on earth can actually have the same thoughts, the same feelings that we have. So maybe there's a different level of respect for them. We believe we can actually cure contagious diseases because of CRISPR-Cas9. The scientists in that area believe that that's actually a very possible goal. And so we should just do it. Curing aging, we talked about alien life. Flying cars don't solve any problems for us. But we want them. <laughs> if I got a flying car and you had to drive here and I flew, you're going to wish you had one. <laughs> See, we're not machines. Machines want efficiency, but we're human beings. And there's more to us than efficiency and there's more to us than problem solving. What else? Space mining. Space mining is just solving resource problems. Peter Diamandis has been doing a fabulous job exciting the world about that. Proxima Centauri, real virtual reality, brain interface, art of virtual. It's an interesting list. I don't know if it's the right list. But let's explore it. Now, I'll tell you this brief story. On the 20th of July this year, on that 50th anniversary of the moon landing, I made the mistake of giving this briefing at the UN. And you know, I probably hadn't thought about it too much. But to this audience, I imagine that I'm a little bit more amongst kin and that you look at it and you think, yeah, these are kind of interesting. Well, after I finished the talk, this woman stood up and she said something to the effect of like, that just scares the shit out of me. <laughs> And then there was like a weird quiet moment and uh, yeah, it didn't work out so well. <laughs> so I thought I'd try it here and see if it was any different. <laughs> here we go. But you know, I was thinking about this, the inspirational gold ring and I didn't even, I don't know that I liked the ring. It just looked like a big hole. And so, I think it, it deserves another ring next to it. The ring of problems and the ring of inspirational goals. And then I was thinking rather than a hole, it sort of looked like two eyes and maybe it might represent this idea that we can start to see the world differently. So now here's this question. What's your initiative? Or are you just fixing problems too. I think most of us are fixing problems because we've been trained to do that. Find a problem. You know, what's that? Would you, you just build some cool new thing. What's that going to solve? In fact, we tell entrepreneurs all the time, find a problem and spend a lot of time trying to figure it out. I know you got some cool new thing in your hand but what good is that going to do? And that thinking, I think, is actually hurting us. And it's hurting us. It's hurting us for this very strange reason around what is life actually about? And how do we succeed at ordinary life? Because this, this, I think, is actually the most important question more important than succeeding at inspirational goals and everything else. And I, I've been very blessed and I feel like I had a wonderful education. But honestly, I, I haven't used like 98% of what was taught to me. 98%. I don't know if you feel this way, but if you get like 16 years or something of education, you're not looking for like a 2% return on that. And so this is bothering me. It's bothering me because we've been teaching the same way now for 100 years. 
And, and much of this is actually from British colonialism. And, and it was around, what do you need to learn in order to you know, pay the taxes back? You gotta read the contract, you gotta add up some numbers and things, and actually our educational system is kind of based on those two things. And so, think about whether the education you got led to what you might call the success of your life. And success means a lot of different things. And I'm not necessarily talking the success at work. I'm talking the success of your life, the thing that should matter most to you. I mean, I'm doing it right now. I'm teaching the same way right now. There's a bunch of you here. I'm talking. Some of you are from other countries, and, and maybe you'd wish I'd slow down a little bit because English isn't the first language. Some of you are like, I wish he'd speed up. I mean, there's probably like four people in here I'm actually doing this at the right speed at. And that doesn't even take into account learning style. I mean, I'm a visionary probably. I like vision, I like thinking, but some of you might be auditory and wish I wasn't distracting you with showing pictures. And some of you are kinesthetic and, and wish I'd be a little more emotional about things. There's like one of you that's actually getting this the right way. <laughs> so we gotta think about <laughs> we have to think about education differently. We have to think about it differently. Because we're still doing it. So, this is the problem. Alma bought a laptop computer at a store that gave a 20% discount off its original price. The total amount she paid to the cashier was P dollars, including an 8% sales tax on the discounted price. Which of the following represents the original price of the computer in terms of P? That's a real question off of an American standardized test. Now, when I looked at that question, I just thought, well, if you're trying to figure out the price of the computer, you should just look at the label. But somehow, this made it complex. Our education system doesn't disrupt because we have a standardized test. You can't change a school system. You can't change the curriculum because the only way you're measured is by how your students do on the standardized test. So if you start teaching something different, if you start teaching the kinds of things that you learn today, it's not going to help any student on their standardized test. And as a result of that, they won't do as well. And then they won't get into the college of their choice. And then because they don't get into a, a good college, their whole life gets changed. In fact, the school system itself creates a negative life for them because they didn't succeed at it, even though it has nothing to do with success in life. Here's another one. In the complex plane, the horizontal axis is called the real axis, and the vertical axis is called the imaginary axis. The complex number, A plus BI, graphed in the complex plane, blah, 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 blah. Which of the complex numbers below has the greatest modulus? This is a real question on the national standardized test. Now, I don't know about you, but I have never had to use an imaginary number in my life. <laughs> I, I can't stop. <laughs> this, is a, this is the British standardized test. Blah, blah, blah. So, so these British students, this was a real question. They got all upset about it. And they were, look at this. There was one person in the exam hall who was crying their eyes out during the exam. You know, look at the, look at the question. It's crazy. There are N sweets in a bag. Six of the sweets are orange. The rest of the sweets are yellow. Hannah takes at random a sweet from the bag and she eats the sweet. Hannah then takes at random another sweet from the bag and she eats the sweet. The probability that Hannah eats two orange sweets is one-third. Show that n squared minus n minus 90 is equal to zero. That's a real question. <laughs> if, 
Here is a question that an eight-year-old answered. Very similar to this one. Bob has 36 candy bars. He eats 29. What does he have now? <laughs> diabetes. Bob has diabetes. Now this is a brilliant question and a brilliant answer. This is a brilliant question and a brilliant answer. Why didn't the test, why, if the test told us that eating sweets your whole life, you would get diabetes, that would save us from all the suffering. <laughs> the new SAT questions, this is a cartoon. A high school student secures a college loan for $80,000 at 8% interest. Assuming the economy is still in the tank after graduation, and that only low-paying service sector jobs are available, and factoring for inflation, can the loan be repaid before the student dies of old age? <laughs> now that's a good question. See, what if we train people to succeed in ordinary life? I mean, I feel like I spent the last 30 years of my life trying to figure out how to just succeed at life. And, and now that I feel like I've done it for the way that I thought about it, I realize, you know, it, it wasn't that hard. It just took 30 years to figure it out. But there's not that much to it. And maybe we would disagree on some details of it, but I think, I think we'll agree on the basis. And what I realize is that there's only like four things. There's only four things. Here's the four, I think. Health and longevity. You know, if you don't have your health, people have lots of goals. You don't have your health, how many you got? One. You can't be happy without your health. You can't. You can be helping all the people in the world and doing the most extraordinary things to give you fulfillment and everything else. But if you're 36 and you got diabetes from eating too much candy, you're thinking only about one thing. Here's another. Wealth creation and retention. Most of us spend our entire life trying to create enough money so that we actually have enough money that we can spend it rather than trying to just save it. And retention. For if, you, if you haven't made a lot of money, because I had to do it twice, three times actually, because I lost all the money after I made it. And then I was like, oh, well, I just screwed up somehow, and then I did it again, and then I lost it again. And then I realized, oh, it's a different skill. <laughs> it's not immediately obvious, but it would have been really helpful in high school if someone had told me it's a different skill. Because <laughs> I pushed away I, like 20 years doing that. So let's just teach it, because they're very teachable. We know how to teach people these skills. It's not that hard. I mean, wealth is about focus and entrepreneurship, and retention is about diversification. Because there's nowhere safe where you can put all your money. There isn't. There's nothing. Eventually, every safe thing becomes unsafe at some point in time. And if you just stick it in one or two things, you're not going to keep it for very long. Relationships and leadership. All of your life happiness is going to come from the emotions and the relationships you have with it, that's easy. And yet almost all of us, I guarantee it, have some trouble at some point in their life with relationships with things that are pretty simple and that somebody could just explain. And sometimes we do that. And leadership is actually just about relationships. It's different than management. You heard that on the stage. It's a totally different skill. We can teach management really easy. Leadership we can teach too. 
it's a little bit harder because you don't necessarily teach leadership. You, you teach character, which was the things that you wanted to learn anyway when you were in kind of kindergarten or elementary school or high school. And those we don't teach anymore because we think we should teach those SAT questions instead. And then happiness and fulfillment. And now we understand that enough to know how to do that. And people are constantly trying to figure out how can I be happy? And then they finally figure out how to be happy because it doesn't last actually very long. I mean, happy, happy is easy. You know, buy, buy a new car, you'll be happy. But then four days later, when someone dents your car, then you're not happy. And, uh, you know, fulfillment is different, but we know what those things are and we can teach that. And can you imagine if we taught this, if you'd learned this instead and you started with this? And so now your education, all those extra things you would be learning would be like a hobby. So we're going to try this out. And there's a number of people there in the room today and... Over the last year, they've been working on an idea to just, well, let's just teach the skills of life success. The challenge is that those skills don't get taught like this. You can't learn leadership by reading a book. You can learn some things about it. You can't even learn to live a healthy life by reading a book. You can learn what not to eat and what to eat but knowledge is different than execution. And somewhere you also have to get inspired enough to actually do it. And then even when you're inspired enough to do it, there's a different set of skills that are required to build the habit of doing it so it becomes a part of your life. And so we know, though, how to teach people skills of habit. We just don't do it in the civilian world. There's organizations that do it. There's religious organizations that do it. The military does it. And they've gotten really good at it. But it's bizarre to me that you can't go somewhere in the world and just learn these things. So it's an experiment. We're going to try it out. We call it this Jedi training. And the idea is just to train people to succeed in life. And so we'll create some exhilarating experiences around the world. And we got to just an eclectic group of people. I mean, a really strange group of people. None of them are teachers. Not one. They're human performance experts. There's uh, some Navy SEALs. There's uh, some Michelin chefs. There's CIA officers. There's, I mean, it's, this is the most bizarre group of people, but it's people who have learned something to mastery, and they've trained someone to mastery. And they've trained not just the skill, but the character. And I have no idea at all if it'll work. But we thought we'd experiment and try it out. But I share this with you because I want this to be happening around the world, a new conversation around what we should be teaching people in the world. Because the biggest problems in the world, and I know it's exciting that Wilbur and Wright came from Dayton, Ohio, and especially for me, but last week, Dayton, Ohio was the site of a mass killing, one of the biggest. And I think those kinds of problems happen because we don't do this well. And I have no idea if that killer scored well on an SAT test or not but I bet it had absolutely no effect on discouraging him to do what he did. This concept of a leader is a hard one, and I've been struggling with it. And I've been struggling with even this idea was, were the Wright brothers leaders? I mean, it's hard to know. Were the Wright brothers leaders? Because what, what actually is a leader? I mean, we, we have words to describe it, but if you start asking the why question, 
why do we really have leadership? It's hard to get it, and it's hard to know when you see it until you see it. I'll give you an example. Shortly after I had um, come off of active duty, I'd been in civilian life for about 10 years, and then 9-11 happened. And I remember somehow just feeling bad about it. And so I decided to go back into sort of active reserve service. And I did it one, because I wanted to try to have the impact, but two is I thought I might learn something different than when I went through it sort of the first time. You know, imagine, imagine what it'd be like to go through high school now with everything you know. And it'd be different, I bet. <laughs> might be really interesting, but you'd learn something different because of what you know. So I'm on active duty and it's my first week again and I had this problem I had to do. And the problem was, it was a form that I had to fill out for a trip that I had taken in order to go for the training to restart again. And I was told that it, there was a deadline on when the form had to be in, otherwise I wouldn't be reimbursed the amount, which was like you know, three or $4,000 for the trip. And so I look at the form, and I don't know if any of you have ever worked for the government, but the government can be really bureaucratic. And it's a little different than civilian life. And this form is like six pages long to fill out the fact that I went on a trip for a week. And it says really clearly at the top that if you don't do it right, it's just rejected. And you get one try and then you don't get the money, which I guess is an incentive to try and do it right. And so it's 4.30 in the afternoon. And if you're not at war, you can just leave at 4.30, which is what most people, military people do if they're not actually in a combat role. And so here I am, 4.30, and I gotta get the form in. And I've got a supervisor, I was a captain at the time, I have a supervisor who was another captain, we had a supervisor who was a major, and that major had a lieutenant colonel, and the lieutenant colonel, and so I'm, I'm six levels away from the commander. And the commander walks by me and sees me struggling with his form. And he has three kids at home. And I know he left every day at 4.30. And he sits down with me and starts to work on this form. And it's very clear within the first five minutes that it's going to take hours to finish this form. And he stayed there until midnight with me and finished my travel voucher form. Now, I don't know if you've had anything like this, but Colonel Lewis, he suddenly passed away about a year after that. And at his funeral, Grown soldiers wept. I don't know if you've ever been to a military funeral, but grown soldiers don't cry at military funerals. And they wept. And I can't to this date, even when that happened, I could barely remember the name of any commander from back then. But I remembered Colonel Lewis because it changed how I thought. And when people at his funeral spoke, they didn't say Colonel Lewis was a great commander or Colonel Lewis was a great leader. They said, I love that guy. I would have given my life for that guy. Leadership is different sometimes than what we think. So it's not about management. But it's also, it's not always about creating visions and strategies and resource allocation and bodybuilding the organization and recruiting and it's something different. Great leadership is something different. And Colonel Lewis had it.
I owe a great thanks to Colonel Lewis because he changed the way I thought the rest of my entire life because of that one evening. And my realization at the funeral was that he hadn't just done that for me, that he'd done it for everyone else too. Because he thought about leadership in a way that I had never thought about it before. Because what really is leadership? I mean, what if anyone who generally went out of their way to help people was a leader? Because now I'm convinced more than ever that that's what it really means. And if that is the new definition of it, then who is it that can be a leader? Anyone. And if anything I've learned from working with large organizations in the last several years on problems that are really hard for them, I think one of the things that they've learned is that we have managers and we have people that we call leaders, but those aren't all our leaders. In fact, many of them really aren't our leaders. And that we actually have a lot of people that have no authority at all. And they're the people that are the leaders. Because if you ask people in your organization, who are the real leaders, they can point to them and they can tell you. And recently, a, an organization that I worked with had said to me, hey, we want you to come and actually meet with some of the people in our company. I was like, that's great. What, you know, what's it about? And they said, well, we can't tell you. I said, oh, well, why can't you tell me? And they said, oh, we can't tell you that. So I said, I'll come. <laughs> and I get there, and I'm going to walk into the room, and I ask somebody outside the room. I was like, hey, you know, what's, what's this meeting about? And she had no idea. And so I asked someone else. I asked two other. They have no idea. We get into the room. The CFO is in the room. And the CFO says, hey, I brought all of you here because we had our managers and our leaders in the company identify the people that everyone else was actually listening to. And they're you and we want to get you on board. And that company, 140,000 people, attributes that meeting to one of the most significant and impactful changes that they ever had in their organization. See, is it possible that whoever helps the most people, the most is the best leader? Because if that's true, now we have to think a little differently about the Wright brothers and about what they did. Because if you looked at the world today, the impact that that had, that moment, was so extraordinary that some leaders, you might not realize that they're leaders till 100 years later. This is a real demonstration of the air traffic over a single city in the United Kingdom. This is what it looks like in just 18 hours. This is Gatwick. This is flight. This is, this is a system. Systems are exponential too. And this is happening all over the world because of what they did. In fact, because of what they did, the world used to be huge. It would have taken some of you a year or two, just six or seven generations ago, to even get here. And you probably wouldn't have made it. And now, you got here in a day, 12 hours, 14 hours. Somehow, the world, because of that innovation and the work that they did, the world got small. See, making a difference is hard. And you might look at that and think, you know, what chance do I have, though, of figuring something like that out? How can I ever make a difference? I can't be the Wright brothers. I'm not going to figure out flight. But that's not how this works. It works in a more subtle way. And it works in a subtle way because of this law, the butterfly effect, that something as small as the flutter of a butterfly's wing ultimately causes a typhoon halfway around the world. And we know this. We know this because we have supercomputers that can model weather in the world. 
And when we trace back the sources of a hurricane or a typhoon, they trace back to some little whispery wind somewhere. That some tiny little thing creates a giant thing. And that's actually how the world works. And it's how leadership works, and it's how innovation works, and it's how disruption works. And if you went back and you looked at any of the great leaders in the world about what they did, you'd see it. And last year when I was here, I talked a little about Martin Luther King and the extraordinary changes that he had. And the significant point of that story was not that he could make significant changes. The point of the story was that everything he did was inspired by one woman. One woman, because of where she chose to sit one day on a bus. It's worth saying again, one woman changed the world because of a single moment in her life on where she chose to sit on a bus. This is a little toy has two little fans on it, there's a rubber band. And you can take it and you can wind it up. And when you let it go, it'll fly up into the air. Usually bounce off the ceiling and crash. The first one was made by a French gentleman in the late 1800s. He made it as a toy and then he sold it. True story. According to brothers Wilbur and Orville Wright, it began for them with a toy from France, a small helicopter brought home by their father. It was little more than a stick with twin propellers and twisted rubber bands and probably cost 50 cents. Look here, boy, said the father, something concealed in his hands. When he let it go, it flew to the ceiling and it bounced off the ceiling and it fell to the ground. And they were fascinated by it. And they did it over and over again until it broke. And then they tried to fix it. And if you read any of the scripts written about Wilbur and Orville Wright, they will clearly all agree on one thing. That all of the works they did were inspired by that little toy. Because of the global aircraft transportation system, our world has shrunk to less than a day-sized world to get anywhere. Because of a, a father spun a rubber band toy in a single minute of his life for the two sons that he loved, the entire earth got shrunk. Every person in this room can change the world. And the smallest little thing you do can do it. What might you do tomorrow? Thank you.